14 to 32 hours, you should see it in that time period. So from the time if you eat it at 5 p.m., you should be seeing it 14 to 32 hours after that time. Okay. All right. Great. And um, I, I think this was an interesting interesting thing, and um, I, I'll let you speak to it that, um, you know, certain things like fiber doesn't get digested um, by the body. That's, that is, you know, what makes, that's one of the defining characteristics. Um, and yet fiber is so important for, to us. If we're not digesting the fiber ourselves, why is fiber important to us? I'm saying, right. sir. So. I mean, we, we go as far to, as to say, you know how we have essential amino acids, essential fatty acids, fiber is the essential carbohydrate, right? We, we don't really hear about the essential carbohydrate. There's been some studies on that and, and they're like, oh, we don't know if we can call it that yet. We call it that. Like we, we feel like there's enough evidence to call it that because we don't make fiber, right? We have to get fiber from outside, just like that's why we call it essential. And so why is that? If we don't even, we're not even absorbing the fiber. We're not plants, right? We don't have cellulose in our body that we're making. So it's like, why is it so important? Again, like you, you're alluding to, you know this the microbes eat the fiber, right? And that that's what we're calling prebiotics. That's what we're feeding our microbes. So really, yeah, it, it's it's really insane that we know we have this microbiome. We know we need to feed it. What, what does it like to eat? Fiber, right? The beans, peas, legumes, nuts, seeds, fruits, vegetables, right? All, all these wonderful fiber-rich foods are not just feeding, not just feeding you, they're feeding your microbes. And that's even more the case when we're talking about flavonoids and these polyphenols and these colors. Antioxidants. The antioxidants. The anti why they're antioxidants is because first and foremost, the bacteria is taking the color, let's call it the, the flavonoid and the, the pigmentation and transforming it into an antioxidant for you, right? You're not going to do that yourself. It's your microbiome that's going to do that for you or your, your microbiota. So, And I think when people think fiber, they think, okay, I need more celery and I need more roughage and apples and kale. And yes, absolutely. Those are helpful. You do want some of that insoluble fiber. Certain microbes really love that rough, dense fiber for them to chew on. Mm -hmm. And you do also need a lot of insoluble starchy type of carbohydrate and starchy type of fiber because one, that draws water into the intestines, it hydrates the stool. And we do know that the microbes make the highest amount of postbiotics, right? Those byproducts that these bugs are making through starch. So there have been studies that have shown some of the foods that are most helpful for making those short chain fatty acids, those postbiotics, those byproducts are things like potatoes, potato starch in particular. So that's that resistant starch that we get when we bake a bunch of potatoes and then throw them in the refrigerator and they create that little film on top of them. That resistant starch is a favorite food for your gut bugs. We find that in things like green bananas or green banana flour. Overnight oats are really rich in that or white rice. You know, sometimes if you make a pot of white rice, you let it cool down or maybe you ran out of time. You have to just stick the pot in the refrigerator and there's this little film all around the pot. That's what emerges from the grains or the starches um, when they've gone under certain conditions. That is actually really rich for your microbes. So if you see that film there, eat it. You don't want to scrape it off. Your gut bugs really want to be consuming that. So these starchy foods like beans and things that people cut out of their diet because they're harder to digest your bugs need those you need to feed your healthy bugs so it's so important to feed those bugs if, if it's not for us it's for them so i read a post um on social media you know recently and and they were talking about oh you know you want to stay away from starch why you know why is starch so vilified when the research suggests that starch is so essential for the microbiome and the microbiome is so important for our health. Well, I think first and foremost, the starch in the context of, especially in the US, I think we think of French fries and we think of like the, the corn starch that's an additive in a lot of the processed foods and we think of just hyper processed starch. And I think so first and foremost, those who are maybe, and this was me like early on, like in my high school bodybuilder phase, thinking I knew everything about nutrition and you're thinking like, yeah, low carb and I just want to build muscle and look good. And 
and you're thinking starch bad, carbs bad, lots of energy. And it's true. I mean, carb carbohydrates do have energy and you have to be, we're not saying to consume a whole meal of just white rice, right? It's, it's definitely about balance. And so I think in the context of that, when you're used to the standard American diet or when you're kind of just first waking up from it and trying to be healthier, it's easy to vilify carbohydrates because you're like, man, they've been making me sick this whole time. Oh, it's the white rice and potatoes negating the fact or forgetting the fact that you also eat a hyper processed diet. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And I think we're, we're of a, a society of instant gratification, right? Yeah. Starch is going to retain, starch is going to absorb water. So after you've eaten a very starchy meal, you're also retaining more water than if you eat just a protein, very high protein, non-starchy meal. Um, so I think then people say, oh, it, it makes me gain weight so quickly. It's water weight. You're, you're going to lose that water weight once you, your, <laughs> your gastrointestinal tract breaks apart the starch. Um, and so, yeah, I think for that reason, and you know, the fact that now people are wearing CGMs, continuous glucose monitors, and they're like, that starch makes my blood sugar go up so high. We don't have good data on showing what that even means. If you have an initial spike, there's no data to say, oh, that's really bad. It's just how you recover from the spike within a two hour period after your meal. So I think for that reason, if people are like instantly, my blood sugar goes up instantly within the day, I gain weight, starch bad, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, we need to have more long-term understanding of the topic and just balance, right? I think any of these fear-based thought processes just aren't balanced thinking. So of course, don't eat only starch, but also don't completely cut out the starch. Yeah. So you kind of hit on the point of these tool, like these tools that we're, we're wearing and all this information that we're having is simplifying our, our understanding of what's going on outside of a context of what's actually going on. So you see a peak, but you don't recognize that when you eat certain things like plant-based things that when, if you have a spike, it will go up and then go down slowly over time and not go too far below baseline, if at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How else have you seen the simplification of, of nutrition? Um, mm. People think they know what they're talking about, like a high school a bodybuilder, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, and how, how does that negatively impact our health? In so many ways, yeah. I think we're always looking for just the next gimmick, the next quick fix, whether that was a few years ago, it was food sensitivity testing, right? Everyone was doing this, sending in their hair, a spot of their blood, their saliva for this test to then within a few business days, tell them, okay, you're allergic to this 27 different foods. Um, so I think that's an oversimplification. And now we're really finally undoing a lot of that damage of saying, that never meant that you were in allergic or intolerant to those foods. Really, that test just tells you if you have leaky gut and food just got into your bloodstream. So when we're oversimplifying things or saying this A plus B always equals C, it doesn't allow for the nuance. And even though we all have similar you know, physiology, anatomy, we're all going to have a unique microbiome. So it doesn't really take that into account. So I think all of these fad diets that are just promising you the next quickest thing, whether it's you know, cut out all whatever fat from your diet, cut out all carbohydrates from your diet, eat keto, eat carnivore, you know, eat fruit only, eat vegetables only, and don't eat anything else. It really is not looking at the totality of how complex our bodies are, how complex our relationship with food is, and how that is going to impact how we tolerate digest and absorb a wide variety of different foods. And if I had to say, even, I mean, in our field, like we, we understand stool testing can be mm -hmm. helpful, but also when you're lacking the context of there's been studies to show uh, what we thought were dangerous viruses in, in cord blood and umbilical cord blood, and also in the fetal uh, development and what, what we thought was a sterile environment. And that's where you have the, this blood uh, really, uh, this really cool complex blood barrier protecting the fetus. We're going, oh, wow, there's E. coli in there. And there's, you know, all these other really cool viruses that are, that we thought were dangerous, but they're not harming the baby. What are they doing there? We're losing that, or, or maybe or a lot of people never had this understanding of this ecosystem. And as long as things are in balance, they're not going to do harm. As long as the, again, the, the rats are there, the coyotes are there, the mountain lions are there. They're not constantly attacking us, trying to kill us. Right. But obviously if you go 
in the middle of the night all by yourself out on a hike that you know there's bears and mountain lions and coyotes, you might get attacked, right? You're putting yourself in a bad position. And I think we as Americans and many of us in first world countries are doing the surgeries, are taking the medications, are not eating. We're putting ourselves in a bad situation and then getting mad at the fact that, man, we got attacked. We got parasite. We got E. coli. Point. We got, you know, and, and we're mad at the microbes, not looking at the context, right? So in stool testing, we're going, oh my gosh, I saw my stool test. There's uh, e. coli, H. H. pylori. Uh, so I started taking oil of oregano and I, I researched online that mm -hmm. this concentrated, even it could be herbal, this concentrated herb helps with H. pylori, not realizing we always have H. pylori. Everybody has H. pylori. Sometimes it could go up, but that or doesn't it's mean- virulent. You, you really only need to intervene if it's virulent right. and you have symptoms. So is it active? Do you have symptoms? If not- you see it on a test and if you're unsure how to interpret that test you're going to inter you're going to try to intervene and overzealously intervene a lot of the times which then can cause even more damage and you're like oh my god so it's it's really yeah that's a big one i would say those are the two big big ones we see yeah for sure so i i you know i think it was with dr pam popper also that um we were talking about the dangers of early detection where we're when we're mm -hmm. It's like cancer and everyone has cancer happening in their body all the time, but a healthy yeah. body is able to fight that off and, and prevent it. And if we do these early detections, it ultimately pulls people into the healthcare system that um, weren't really at risk of any sort of health issue. And now they're at risk of being negatively impacted by the healthcare system with doing all these tests and these procedures as they go any further, do you see that based on what you were just saying with the, the viruses? Do you see that with regard to microbiome health and people doing these stool tests and, and that that type of testing as well? I'll let you speak on that. I wouldn't say stool tests per se are going to give you any of that information, but you know, we have things like the Cologuard, which is a different type of stool test. So outside of a functional stool test, you have the Cologuard. Um, and you know, there's conflicting opinions on whether colonoscopies are beneficial or not. We're big proponents for colonoscopies. I, I believe colonoscopies save lives. Um, but the Cologuard has a 13% false positive rate. And so, you know, if you are receiving this information that yes, you do have cancer cells detected in the Cologuard, um, one that's going to ring bells of alarm and you're going to create then stress, which can then stress out your gut bugs um, and maybe overzealously intervene once again. So, you know, I think it's important for people to reconnect with their bodies. If something seems off, if you're having rectal bleeding, if you're having abdominal distension and pain that can't be explained, then that's a sign that a colonoscopy can be helpful. Or, you know, if you've reached the age of 45, it it is recommended that you do get a colonoscopy because colon cancer is the number one fastest rising cancer, especially from the ages of 20 to 50. And so if we can detect it, if we can get some eyes in there and really see, hey, you have a precancerous polyp, you have a cancerous polyp, that can be easily removed before it can metastasize and before it can move to other areas of the body. So yeah, I would say I'm not a huge fan of Cologuard in general, um, because I think then people get overconfident in them. I've also had other people tell me I did a Cologuard stool test and it said I was great, no cancer cells detected. And I ended up having stage four colon cancer after that. Um, so yeah, I think again, it's one of those things where it's like, you're trying to circumvent something that's been proven to be real and really helpful. So I know it's not a popular opinion. I know that that's not what some of these other plant-based docs believe either, but I've worked in a gastroenterology office. I've seen the most plant-based people have colon cancer because they were afraid to get a colonoscopy.